So Jill, Jill was nice enough to go out and take about a bazillion pictures of, of weather-related, climate-related stuff around the headquarters area, thinking that we might actually have some really bad weather. So I'll just, I'll just quickly run you through some of these. So, um, when you see these out in the prairie, these are for collecting rainfall, but they're not for rainfall amounts. I'll show you those. The metal rain gauges we use for rainfall amount are very um, precise, but they're terrible for chemical analysis because the rain reacts with the metal. So to collect samples for, for chemical analysis, you want to use plastic, inert plastic. And that's what these are. So it's just a, it's a, it's a funnel stuck into an acid-washed plastic jar. And that collects samples we can analyze for the chemical concentrations in rain. So that's what those are. OK, so how about the, the big eye balloon? Oh, yeah, the big eye balloon. So normally, a lot of times on here, there will be the big eye balloons. Mm -hmm. And that's like a, go ahead. Scaring the birds away, yeah, exactly, because what we don't necessarily want to measure is the chemical concentration of bird crap. Which is what we end up, which we end up, what, we end up in the funnels. And does it work? Does it scare them away? I don't know. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think it does help. I, I know I was afraid to go there. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> it does help. The other thing I'll tell you is that there's a lot of these scattered around Kanza, and part of the reason is that on some days there's always. So, the other thing that will happen is bugs will happen. Or a bit of a leaf will fall in there. If something like that happens, we have to toss the sample because it's contaminated. We want clean samples for these analyses. Mm -hmm. and, and so these things are only emptied after it rains. Mm -hmm. um, they're left out there, and then when we get more than a three millimeter rainfall, that's when we collect those. And they're taken back to, to campus so they can be analyzed for, for the chemical content. And there's lots of pictures of these floating around, so just <laughs> this one up close. <laughs> I'm gonna, I don't have big I was being this complete. Is like awesome. this, this, is awesome. <laughs> this, this actually is a rain gauge. It's just to supplement the other rain gauges we have. So it, it, you can measure rain depth in here. And then this is the acid wash bottle and the funnel that again we use for um, collecting rainfall. See, but this doesn't have, you know, it doesn't have a fine edge. It's not designed for quantity, it's just for quality. <clears throat> and this one's the head. This, they're all labeled too. They're in different locations around campus. About how many? About how many? Uh, I, I want to say eight. I will say eight, but I don't know if that's exactly right. <laughs> <eight. laughs> I, mean, I think it roughly matches the number of metal rain gauges we have scattered around, which is also about eight. And that, that's important because even a, even a small place the size of Kanza, rainfall varies across the site. From the south end to the north end, you can get different rainfall amounts. And originally, the reason we have multiple rain gauges, it was set up so that you could triangulate across those if you wanted to and estimate an actual rainfall amount across the whole site. Um, so a, a lot of our other climate and weather related uh, equipment is all located here in the headquarters area. And um, this is our original weather station that, that we set up with LTER that we operate independently. Um, there's, there's a lot more pictures of all that. Yeah, so, so <laughs> let's see, let's zip down here. So within our weather station, we have these, yeah. I'm just curious about <clears throat> How often or what percentage of the time do your uh, uh, water samples get contaminated with uh, you know, yeah. it, wood? Is it, it quite a often occurrence? Or? It is. Um, I don't know. I would guess maybe a quarter of them um, yeah. get contaminated. And, and again, not, not as much with bird droppings now that we have that stuff up, but just you know, insects just dropping in there and things like that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so that's, that's always a problem with these samples. You need to uh -huh. collect a lot of them. These are, these are the rain gauges we use for a mount. And you'll see these as you drive around Kanza because there's some scattered along the main road as well. And these are, these are a weighing rain gauges. They're made by Belfort, it's the company, Belfort Weighing Rain Gauges. The basic idea is that they have a very precise opening of, an, of a known area. It's kind of got a sharp knife edge on top. So you know exactly what area it's collecting from. And the rain goes in here and it collects in a bucket inside there. They're sitting on, on basically little pan balance. And if you open this door, there's a, there's a chart recorder in there with chart paper that's slowly writing on, on a little clock mechanism, and there's a pen that's tracing against it. So when it rains, it pushes down on that, and the pen will trace, depending on the amount of rain and how far down the bucket's been pushed. And, and we take those chart papers then back to campus and read from there what the rainfall events have been. These are calibrated about once a year. This is. So the next one is looking down, I think, looking down into the Belfort Grain Gauge. <laughs> this is a newer kind of rain gauge. So to the Belfort Rain Gauges are mechanical. They have to be calibrated annually. 
and, and, and they're just subject to more error than we would like sometimes. So a newer kind of rain gauge, this is a, a, a vibrating wire rain gauge. It also works by weighing the rain, but it uses a different principle. It's got three strain wires that measure the amount of strain depending on the weight of rain. It's, and I don't know the physics behind this. It's a vibrating wire method, though. The frequency with which the wires vibrate is directly proportional to the weight that's being pushed against them, or the amount of strain on them. So these are thought to be a lot more accurate, and they don't require as often calibration. So they're probably good. more expensive. They are. Yeah, I don't remember what we paid for this one. You know, when, when a truck backs over one of these, you're, you're not happy to clean it. But so this is, this is we, but we're supplementing our other rain gauges with this one right now at the headquarters area. There's, that's the only place we have a library in the And see, you can collect bugs in there. That's not part of it. And this one we don't empty regularly. So these things have probably been collecting for a while. And we wouldn't use this for chemical concentrations, just for amounts. It's a great picture. <laughs> Um, if you go in the headquarters area, we have two of the old Belfort rain gauges, the, the metal can rain gauges, and one of them is over here without this fence around it. And this one has a little kind of fence with baffles around it. This was originally set up because in Kansas, a lot of our rain comes in sideways, right? We get these floors where the wind's really blowing. And the question was, if the wind is blowing really hard, is how much of that rain is just skipping the top of the bucket? Is it not going in? And so the thought was, well, if you put up a wind baffle around one of these gauges, we'll compare that with a, with a gauge that doesn't have a wind baffle and see if there's any, any difference. And it turns out there's not. Um, they, but they've left this up. So we have two, two rain gauges that are kind of redundant with one another, one with a baffle, one without. But that's what the baffle was originally set up for. It really doesn't seem to have much of an effect. This particular rain gauge is winterized. So uh, there are some rain gauges we don't use in the winter. So they don't work well for snow and ice. And so they're covered with plastic and duct tape, and very soon those will come off again. The, the vibrating wire one runs here around. Um, we have a lot of other agencies that set up um, other monitoring equipment related to climate in the headquarters area. This is actually operated by the EPA. It's part of a network called CASTNET, C-A-S-T, CAST. ET, CAST Net, N E T. It's Clean Air Standards and Trends Network. And what they measure, they measure um, ozone, but not, not stratospheric ozone. <coughs> stratospheric ozone is the good ozone, the blocks ultraviolet radiation. Ozone in the troposphere is generally considered bad. It's a, a strong oxidizer, it's a pollutant, it's part of smog in the cities, but it occurs, it occurs naturally as well. And the EPA is curious about monitoring spatial patterns of ozone over the we're in an area that should be relatively clean, relatively unaffected, at least by urban activity. And so they monitor tropospheric ozone, is one thing they do. And they also collect um, aerosols, particles in the atmosphere that contain nitrogen and sulfur. And they do that underneath that upside down bucket. There are, there's a, there's a, um, an inlet that takes gas back into the trailer to an ozone monitor. And there's another inlet that has a, th a three-stage filter pack that collects particles, collects aerosols. And that's useful information for us, because if the, the aerosols that contain nitrogen and sulfur are parts of our, of our nitrogen and sulfur budget, we'd like to know how much is coming in annually in aerosols. Okay, so John? Yeah. So they share their information with us? They do. They, 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 so the deal with them is that we, we um, provide the technical support, so we change out the filters, monitor the station once, once a week, we recalibrate the, the flow meters. Rosemary Romando, our one of our technicians, does that. And I think we also pay the electric and phone bill to, to operate this. They provided all the equipment, they do all the chemical analyses, and they maintain the data, but they provide it to us. So we have partnerships with, the, with EPA on this one. The, the filters are in the uh, structure, so that's no. just, or is there one up there in the top? The yeah, the filter pack's actually up under that bucket. And so this 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 uh, tower, Rosemary climbs this every Tuesday. No, no she doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hinged, and it's on pulleys. And so what she does is she lowers this every every week. And then you pull out. It's actually, it's pretty cool, but it's really heavy. You have to wear a hard hat when you, when you do this, because you don't want to fall, so you're in trouble. It's a, it's a steel stainless steel case container that has these three-stage filter packs, and they're treated differently. So one collects um, nitric acid vapor, one collects uh, sulfur dioxide aerosols, and the other one collects ammonia-containing particles. And 
and then those all get sent back to the, and there's a whole network of these, there's, I forget, I think there's roughly a hundred and some test bed sites around the country, and they're all, they're all analyzed in the same way, same protocol, so it all goes into a common database. Associated with this, there's a lot of micro uh, climate measurements. So um, wind direction, um, an anemometer, which measures wind speed. So those are, those are the little cups that spin depending on wind speed. So that's, a, that's a, an anemometer. This device is called a pyranometer, P-Y-R-A-nometer, <laughs> um, that, that measures solar input. Okay, so it measures the total amount of solar energy coming in. Why the oh lightning rod? Like, lightning rod, yeah. yes, yeah. lightning rod as well. <clears throat> um, this is our weather tripod. So this is the one that we set up back in 1980 or 81 to start start measuring weather on Kanza. Mm -hmm. So it's got the same sort of thing. Actually, we just looked at the top of it. This is for measuring um, air temperature, and I believe uh, yeah, yeah, maybe air temperature and relative humidity, if I remember right. This is a, just a sector antenna that sends the data back to campus. We used to have to have a data logger that recorded data, and then somebody would manually come out here and dump it once a week or once every other week. Now most of our devices in headquarters are all wireless, and they send the data directly back to campus. So on top of the hiking trail hill, there's a repeater that sends data back to an antenna on top of Bushnell or uh, Eckert Hall, which then is wired to send data back to Bushnell Hall where we live. So the data loggers still collect data here, but they send it directly back. Oh, what else do we have? We have oh, a tipping rain gauge, which again, this one's winterized for now. That's another kind of rain gauge that works. It's got, it's got a bucket on a, on a, a teeter-totter that tips back and forth. So one, one side of the little teeter-totter fills up and dumps. And the number of dumps back and forth tells you the amount of rain. It's called a tipping bucket rain gauge. So we have, we have a lot of rain gauges. But it's like a man with multiple watches. You never know what time it is. You never know how much rain. Take averages. <clears throat> um, this is for this is for uh, rainfall chemistry, and so this is again part of another network. This is uh, the national. It's, I'll give you the, the, the um, uh, abbreviation first. NADP. The NADP network. And if you look at NADP network online, you'll find them, and you can see all the data as well because they all get all the data publicly available. That's the National Atmospheric Deposition Program. It was set up in the 1980s to address acid rain, primarily, to look at the at rainfall chemistry, and especially acid rain as a problem in the northeastern United States. There are 220 or so sites, though, scattered throughout the US now that measure rainfall chemistry on a weekly basis. And it's useful not only for looking at pollution, but again, for an ecosystems ecologist, I want to know how much nitrogen and phosphorus is coming in the rain. And this is a way of measuring that. So there's two buckets. There's a, there's a, a dry bucket and a wet bucket. And there's a sensor. There's probably other pictures here too, right? Yep. <laughs> so there's, there's a sensor right here. When it rains, so today if we went out there, when it rains, it shorts out a little switch in this sensor, closes the switch. It causes this lid to move over the dry fall bucket and to expose the wet fall bucket. So while it's raining, this bucket is collecting rain, but it's clean rain. There's no bugs or birds or anything, hopefully. And then when it stops raining, there's a little heating element in here that dries it back out fairly quickly, so the lid goes back and covers up the wet fall bucket again. It keeps that rainfall sample clean, so it's only wet fall. And then that, that's how we, we analyze rainfall chemistry without contamination. So it's, it's another way of collecting rain. Um, the dry fall bucket used to be used for collecting dust. We really don't use it for much of anything anymore because it's, it has a lot of contamination associated with it. So that, that we use, there's other ways of getting dry fall estimates. So that's part of, again, a national network measuring chemistry of the rainfall. Do you, have, do you sense uh, remotely somewhere the number of times the arm moves? No, it's, uh, I don't think it's remotely sensed. That's a really good question because there, um, <clears throat> there is a data logger that tells you because if I go out there and lick my finger and stick it on there, which I've done on occasion. Um, I'll hear about it from Rose, but I'm not supposed to do that because it, it opens the bucket, closes it, and she knows about it. So that's the reason I was asking you, because usually they let us doses do that when we were leading tours. Yeah. So finally we were told not to do it. Yeah, yeah. So, so <laughs> it must be not a data 